Sharon Cobert is the president of the Wellness Council of West Virginia and also the president of the National Network of Wellness Councils. Sharon, I'm so glad we were able to pin you down for an hour. Uh, <laughs> no, I am so glad too. Uh, I, good, good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate you uh, joining us this afternoon. Michael, I certainly appreciate you asking me to do this. Um, please bear with me if I have technical issues. I, I shared with the staff at Health Promotion Live that I'm technically inept, and I've really come a long way over the last few years, but um, occasionally I get stuck. I think I'll be okay today with just forwarding slides. That should be good for me. I think you'll be okay. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> well, if you, if, you, if you take a look at your screen in joining us, um, we have the National Network of Wellness Councils. A little history began back in 2008 as uh, wellness councils from across the country. Right now, our affiliates include California, Arizona, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, Nebraska, and Lincoln, Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and West Virginia. And we are working with uh, groups in Washington State, Utah, Kansas, Oklahoma, Kentucky, and North Carolina to form wellness councils. We're nonprofits who work with businesses at a grassroots level to initiate health incentives and interventions to lower health care costs and improve productivity. Other partners that we've worked with since we started in 2008 include the Centers for Disease Control, uh, Health Enhancement Research Organization, National Wellness Institute, and of course, Health Promotion Live. Uh, the objectives of that webinar today is to explain to you a little bit about who we are as a national network, the population, health, and economic development, the tools, some of them that we use for assessing the health and readiness of a community for change, uh, some of the appropriate interventions we've seen work across the country, and then how to evaluate and measure return on investment once you get started. Now, some of these statistics you're going to see uh, are not news to, to the people on the call, I'm sure, but it's still a little startling when you see it. Uh, we spend more on health care in this country than any other industrialized nation. However, we are not the world's healthiest citizens. And back in 2008, we spent $2.2 trillion on health care costs alone, and that has just increased exponentially since then. It's not gone down since 2008. This is a little slide that I like to share with everybody uh, if food were health care. And just looking at inflation over the last 20 years, if eggs had gone up, the price of eggs, the way health care has increased uh, in the last 20 years, we'd be paying over $80 for, for a dozen eggs. Same thing, pound of apples would be over $12, pound of sugar around 13 and my favorite, a dozen oranges would be $107. Um, all those statistics came from the American Institute for Preventive Medicine. And as you all well know, about 70% of disease is preventable and 87.5% of health care claim costs are due to individual lifestyle choices. And you know, that's a pretty broad statement, but when you, when you really think about it, did you take the stairs this morning? Did you take the elevator? Did you uh, have fruit with your breakfast? Did you eat a Pop-Tart for breakfast? What choices you make all day, every day, and your employees make affect their health directly? It's not just, did I decide to exercise today? It's what you decide all day long. Something that really affects us uh, now as far as cost is obesity. Um, it's associated with impairment of work product productivity. Uh, it's estimated that 11 to 15 percent of work time is, is impaired because of issues that someone who is obese have uh, with mobility, with illness, with getting around. Um, that was a statistic presented to us from a doctor from Duke University last year at our annual conference in the fall. And uh, it was really startling to see that that of all uh, chronic disease is the thing that costs us the most money on a daily basis. Um, poor health, physical or mental, is always costly to business, and so therefore we have to look forward to health interventions as a business venture, and we should treat it as such. Uh, I always tell people it's like OSHA has come in 
and told you you can't do that operation in that way anymore. You have to go forward with this mat or this reflective gear or something like that. And I think when you incorporate wellness into the culture of a business, you have to do it fully and full on. It can't be something where you say, well, we've got business over here and wellness takes place in the lunchroom during breaks. Wellness has to be something that's incorporated at the desks, on the computers, in the meetings, in the discussions, with everything that you now communicate with your employees about, in every form that you communicate with your employees about. Um, what we have seen is that cookie cutter programs from consultants and other national groups don't work. That local coalitions are the key to what works in your area. Um, I can do some things in West Virginia that might be useful in Kentucky, but the bottom line is different areas of West Virginia have different resources, different types of people, different educational backgrounds. For that matter, different sides of town do as well. So my location here may not have the same kind of wellness program the one across town has got. And I think you really have to respect that. So you want to um, respect your people, respect their background, respect the resources they have on hand, and not try to force one way of doing things down someone's throat. Um, the thing about the national network is we get on the phone once a month and we have a conference call. And I may say, well, we're looking to do this, how, you know, what do you all think? And someone in Lincoln, Nebraska says, well, this is how we did it. And someone in Arizona says, well, we did something like that and this is what it was. And it's kind of an a la carte kind of thing. I don't have to reinvent the wheel, but I can take pieces of these successful programs and kind of judge what would work here in West Virginia. So it's a really great resource for that uh, model. And when you call someone on the phone, someone answers on the other end. You don't get uh, you know, answering machines and punch this button for this or this button for this. But I think what we're really seeing now is the need to benchmark not only against yourself from year to year. Last year, our risk for cancer was this. This year, our risk for cancer is this. But to benchmark and say, well, people in our industry, in our state, look like this compared to how we look. And people in our industry in other states look like this compared to how we look. So the national network is really interested in compiling good data on the different industries from state to state as well as you know the different programs that take place. So I think you need to look at yourself on a one-on-one, -on -one, this is how we compare against ourselves from our prior history, from a regional you know, in our area, this is what our wellness program is, is accomplishing. From a state, this is how we compare to other people in the state who do what we do, uh, as well as the general population. And then nationally, you know, this is, this is how we do what we do, and this is how we look against people across the country. Um, you'll find most of my quotes are from football coaches because I was raised by one. So uh, success demands singleness of purpose. And I think that is the one thing. Although cookie cutter uh, programming doesn't work um, necessarily for everyone because we all have different needs and different interests, uh, the one thing is we all have to want to get better. We all have to want to find the answer. We all have to want to get better. So it's important for a company to go forward with the singleness of purpose that we are going to operate with a culture of wellness. Not with the wellness program operating in the periphery, but a true culture of wellness from what we serve in the cafeteria to what we talk about in our meetings. Here's a little background on the coalition movement uh, in the country. Coalitions have been around since the 40s. The majority formed, actually, uh, in the early 90s as a response to when the insurance premiums started to increase. I can look at this from a real, very personal level because my uh, professional career began in 91 with an insurance company that was a third-party administrator for self-insured companies. And I saw that self-insured companies were the first people to really get the whole prevention and wellness issue. And so it was fantastic. And I kind of came out of uh, college thinking, well, everybody does it this way. This is an ivory tower sort of way of looking at it. 
And then when I saw more fully insured companies and things, I began to understand that no, not everybody does this. As a matter of fact, a lot of people don't do this, and they're paying for it through the nose, basically. Um, we have local coalitions all across the country, and most of them only have one or two full-time employees in place. Uh, the little logo that you see there at the bottom, Rev Up Madison, is a coalition that we helped to start in southern West Virginia in a coal mining town um, to help revitalize downtown, not only with a Main Street angle of better awnings, nicer planners, better lighting, but from a health perspective. We want our people to be able to walk to town, so they put in a walking path along the river in their community. We want our people, once they get to town, to have a smoke-free environment. So they hung up tobacco-free zone signs along the walking path, in the civic center of the community, the storefronts, and different areas that people had public access to. And it was a real different way of looking things. Not What we think is conducive to business is not just a better place for business physically, and aesthetically speaking, but a better place for the people who are going to be the patrons for the business to come and visit when they come and buy things from us. Some of the good resources for building a local coalition are, of course, the national network. We're in contact, as I said, with several states from all across the country, literally, shore to shore, Washington State to North Carolina, uh, with groups that are trying to start wellness councils. You will find that some states, like West Virginia, have one council that covers the whole state. Our, communi our business community is such so that usually if you have an office in middle of West Virginia, you have one in northern West Virginia, one in eastern West Virginia, and you can work from a, a central radius. But a lot of states, such as, say, North Carolina, you've got several metropolitan areas there. You could feasibly have three or four councils in West Virginia, one just focused on Winston-Salem one just focused on Charlotte, um, one focused on the Raleigh area, one along the coast. So there's a lot of you know different aspects to the development of a wellness council. Some people who want to start one aren't interested in covering the whole state. They want to cover their area. And so we fully support that and want to provide uh, groundwork for people to follow sort of a blueprint so that they're not reinventing the wheel, they're not trying to survive on uh, fruits and berries, so to speak, gathering. Um, they can actually find uh, a system of dues, of products, of services that works, and they can replicate it in their region. We're not interested in competing with them there. Um, I always tell the members of the Wellness Council of West Virginia, and although we are in West Virginia, we have members from Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, uh, Ohio, and Kentucky. Uh, and yeah, yeah, right now we've got them from all the surrounding states. Some of them are mines, some of them are universities, some of them are steel mills. But if they're right there on the border, um, you know, they can join our council and we'll help them the best way we know how. But the best thing we do for our people is probably put them in a room together and let them talk. Because for me to say, well, I want to do an incentive to get people to start walking the stairs more and get them off the elevators, and another company says, oh, well, that's great. We just did this program where we revitalized our stairway and added music and painted it and put these pictures up and the use of our stairways has you know increased by this amount so it's great you know it's something that can be duplicated readily they know it'll work and um, you know they don't have to, to figure out how to do it a different way also to have just the different communities networking is a bonus too but the um, some other groups out there are like the National Business Coalition on Health. We, the Council of West Virginia, are members of two of these. There's not one in West Virginia, but there's one for the Mid-Atlantic region out of Baltimore, and there's one in Virginia, more out of the Norfolk uh, Richmond area. And uh, they provide a lot of resources, newsletters, meetings, but what they don't do is the one-on-one -on -one relationship with each individual business. It's more of a membership subscription service, and it serves a real purpose, but there's also some group buying involved with the National Business Coalition and some nice, um, nice representation as far as numbers go. So I think that, you know, two different things here. As far as the National Network of Wellness Councils, we're trying to get 
a council established right there on site. And the National Business Coalition is more about information and, and lobbying, sort of. So uh, two things that operate very well uh, together um, in existence. Um, collaboration, we always say, is a context for it. <laughs> you have to identify and engage all the stakeholders. You have to leave your agenda at the door. And that's a tough one for some people. Um, we were down, I was down in North Carolina last week. I was working with a group in Winston-Salem. And this business wants to start the uh, Wellness Council and wants to kind of guide it. And this business wants to start a council. But the person who wants to start it wants to be the head of the council. So it's, it's, it's kind of a, um, an interesting uh, perspective there. But I think together, these groups could start one of the strongest uh, collaborations in the country once they get themselves organized. Um, I think that people need to understand that to start a wellness council is not to make sure everybody's buying insurance from your company, but to be a part of a wellness council where you share what you know about the insurance industry if that's your, your job. You can't use it as the marketing aspect. It's, you're more of a support and an informational source for a wellness council. I'm trying to change slides here. There we go. Um, and this is just a quote from one of the uh, groups that really benefited from a, a council all in Kansas City, putting the public and private partners together. And I think that's something that's very important when you're, when you're looking at starting a council and developing a board of directors. Um, the model that works, the councils that have been around the longest and had the most success are West Virginia, Indiana, Rhode Island, Arizona, Lincoln, Nebraska. And what you see on those board of directors is a vast uh, group of varied industries and interests. Not all nonprofits, not all government, not all private industry, but experts in their respective fields. You need someone with some accounting. You need someone with some law. You need someone with some advertising. And it's, it's really interesting to get them together. Um, but you can't have a lot of people at the table who want something you know, other than the, the opportunity to, to push the region forward uh, in health. I keep clicking on the wrong side here. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes when it comes to wellness programming. One of the great mistakes is to judge policies and programs by their intentions rather than their results. And I think that has been the fatal flaw with wellness over the last 25, 30 years is we go out and we have a health fair. And then we're done with the health fair. And then everybody goes home and they had their blood drawn that day. But what we don't know as the employer who sponsored the health fair is how many people came through the line who had issues with cholesterol or were diagnosed as diabetics or had this, that, or the other thing you know, happen. We just sort of let these vendors in. We give them access to our people. And then they exit stage left. And what we really need to focus on with wellness is what do we want out of this before we start? How are we going to get it? And then how are we going to call success at the end? What are we measuring? What are we actually looking for? And then what are we going to do with that data once we get it? So now we know 35% of the people who came through and had a blood draw have cholesterol issues. So what do we do with that information now? Well, we put it into our written wellness plan where we're going to start addressing diet and exercise and cholesterol and you know controlling it and the formulary where we offer meds uh, for cholesterol and we really want to you know use that information to push forward you should have a total transparency when it comes to these sort of things we had our health fair and this is what we found out about your health you know your health is is this this or this and let the employees know and let the management know. And this, so this is why you keep seeing these programs on healthy eating. This is why we change things in the cafeteria, because 50% of you all have weight issues and 30% of you all have high blood pressure. And so we're really you know, trying to get back to what the big health issues are in the company. And that's why we're doing what we're doing. Um, key components to a coalition. I think you have to think about who the community leaders are. In some towns and areas, it's going to be city council, the county commission, the mayor's office, and that crew. 
In others, it may be a leading industry or the only big industry, and you have to have buy-in from that group. Um, you need to think about employers and employees, and you need to have both interests. We, we say you need a needs and interest survey, what people need and what they're interested in. And sometimes what they need is not what they're interested in. Um, Health care providers in the region uh, should contribute and be a part and be represented uh, when you're trying to get a coalition together. Look at your pharmaceutical groups. Uh, I know in North Carolina, in West Virginia, they've got some real involved um, interventions with diabetes patients where the pharmacist and the patient and the doctor are all working in network to talk to each other about a total uh, you know, service home as far as health care goes. Um, religious leaders, a lot of communities have a real strong religious group of leaders who uh, run a lot of programming that's well attended and those are the groups that you need to have buy-in to. They talk to their parishioners, they talk to their church members, they get you know, people in the door when you're having some kind of program. Who are the service providers as far as health issues and non-health issues? Who are the nonprofits in the issue, in the area? And a lot of people make the mistake of having too many nonprofits involved. Um, you want American Heart, you want American Lung, you want American Cancer Society, you want the, you know, all these associations involved, but they can't, you know, they've all got their own agenda and they can't lead the charge, so to speak. You've got to have somebody with no agenda leading the charge. The only agenda is to improve the health and wellness of the workforce. Um, are the schools represented, both for the teachers as employees and for the students as future workers in the region? And is there anybody else that you're, you think you might have left out? Um, you see the little Morgantown Well City logo. A few years ago, uh, the city of Morgantown in northern West Virginia was designated as a well city. They had 20 percent of the businesses um, certified with uh, worksite programs, worksite wellness programs, and got the designation of uh, a well city. And that's a great designation. And it, but, but what are you doing moving forward? You know, 20 percent enough. Um, who are the leaders in those companies? Who are the people with the most buy-in for wellness? Sometimes those sort of things, those sort of uh, campaigns, so to speak, can wear your community out. You get people so involved in this certification that they they get tired of it. And so once you reach, you know, you, you reach victory, you get your uh, designation as a well whatever, you're, you don't want to go forward with this anymore. You're tired of hearing about it. So you've got to be careful to, you know, not to burn out your champions in the community. We talk about the five steps for wellness uh, when we go out and do trainings with the National Network. And the first, of course, is to prepare your community for wellness. Engage the stakeholders who should be most involved, are most involved, business and community leaders. Identify and organize the team. And this team is a living entity. It, it can be added to and taken away from. People will move. People will move in and out of the community. Um, assess the health and readiness of the community. I know locally, one of the most populated counties around here does a three-year uh, phone assessment among the community where they do random calls about health and the perception of health in the, in the region. They then set their agenda for the next three years. They develop work groups. And over the last 10 years, uh, 10 to 12 years, this, a couple of the same issues came up. One was tobacco use. One was uh, seatbelt usage and driving safety, and um, so, and the other was obesity and weight issues among uh, the general population. Um, for the first time three years ago, the issue of uh, children at risk came up as a major issue in the responses that they got to their survey. So they added another work group and started involving. Um, you know, some outside organizations to work with some of the children at risk. So that's a really good assessment. Sometimes you can get data from your uh, Health and Human Resources Department at your state office and look at that and see what the issues are. But I think it's always important to go out into the community and ask questions and talk to people. Um, plan the initiative that you're going to do in writing and talk about SMART objectives, the specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-sensitive issues. 
put it in writing because if someone does move in or out of your network, you've got it in writing. I always call it the hit by a bus plan. If I get hit by a bus, the plan is in writing. Someone else can pick it up and follow it. It's not something that goes with me. Um, enact the programming that you're going to use. Make sure it's appropriate for the population that you've got. Get the feedback on what they thought of a program. And don't be afraid to ask questions. There's no bad feedback. If you have a community walk and the community comes out in droves, and then next year you do the same community walk and nobody comes, you won't know why if you didn't ask for those evaluations, if you didn't ask for opinions on it. Maybe you didn't, it started too early. Maybe it started too late. Maybe the weather was awful and you couldn't do anything about it. Maybe you had the wrong food. Maybe you had the wrong person leading it. Maybe the course wasn't well marked. So you have to get that feedback. And you know, the thing is, when you get the feedback, to respond to it in a way that people know they have been heard and their ideas and opinions have been respected. We heard you. We didn't mark it off well enough. This year when we do it, the whole trail is marked in blaze orange red. People are standing, um, you know, pointing in the direction of where you're going to go. And really, you know, let people know that you've heard, you've, you've addressed, you've responded. Um, Review what you've done for effectiveness and for results, not only with the evaluations, but at the end of the year, you know, with, a, with assessing the general uh, use of the program, the effectiveness of the program, the health risks and how they're measured. We have seen with several coalitions some real changes at a local level. Uh, in health issues, and I know just uh, as far as um, high risk for cancer and, and things like that have been measured at a community level, the, the group in Lincoln, Nebraska is actually based out of the county health department, and so they get some really good statistics, and they can see that a five-year trend analysis of their work well members, not just the people in the community, but their members who are work with the council, have had a decrease in obesity, and a BMI of 30 has gone from 38% to 29%. That's an incredible change in five years for a community when the rest of the country is getting bigger and bigger. So um, you, know, you need to be able to measure those sorts of things and know what kind of questions you want to ask. Identify your core members and constantly reevaluate you know, who they are. Uh, keep the public and private sectors represented. Make sure you're diverse in age, income, ethnic representation, and everything else. I know ethnicity is changing all over the country, and you need to respect that um, when you're putting together your local coalition or your council. Uh, meet regularly. Have a written agenda when you come in. Have minutes when you come out. Be accountable to the community. The people that you're working with need to know what you're doing and why you're doing it. Total transparency is the key. Um, engage leadership. Uh, make the business case for people who need it. Of you know, a decrease in obesity means a decrease in these diseases and a total savings of this. The personal case. Um, you know, this friend of mine had diabetes and couldn't work and couldn't do this. They got their weight regulated. They got their blood sugar regulated. Now they're working, and, and this is going on. Um, even the marketing case, we have a really good company here in West Virginia. One of their major competitors um, is in another state. They started their wellness program basically because when they were doing a little uh, you know, corporate spying on the website of their competitor, they kept seeing stuff about wellness. And the wellness program we offer employees. And, you know, as our stockholders, you need to know that we, you know, spend your money wisely and our health dollars are spent with this and prevention is cheaper than, you know, this. And so they really started a comprehensive wellness program in the beginning um, as a competition marketing thing. So keep that in, in, in mind when you're, you know, who you're talking to when you're trying to get buy-in from community leaders and what you're going to, you know, have them do. Um, assess the health and the morale of a group. When you're talking to your community and assessing what the needs and, and uh, wants are, look at walkable areas. Look at public policies for tobacco-free, clean indoor air regulations. Um, what do the public parks look like? What do the facilities in the parks look like? Do people have a reason 
you know, to utilize the public areas. Uh, some good downtown assessments come in the format of the Main Street program, which is present in all 50 states. And there's another thing called a blueprint community, which is not quite as involved. Main Street actually has um, a group to form a nonprofit to take charge of the Main Street program and revitalizing downtown, whereas a blueprint community is more of an evaluation process um, and a, a task force that gets involved. So think about what the community wants and needs, and not only how it looks, but for business, but the patrons for the business. What is it you know, conducive for them to do? And then again, over in the corner, you see some of the things that the Rev Up Madison group you know, is involved with uh, to get the community involved and, and uh, healthier. Um, an HRA is something that needs to be done for any business and for a community to do, you know, the health risk appraisal to take the pulse and the temperature basically of the group that you're working with, look at the needs and interests of everyone involved, the health and human resource data from your government entities, and then the readiness to move forward. And I think that um, when you're trying to start a council in your region, you need to have some input as to what the best tools are. There's not one HRA that works for everyone. An online HRA may be great for a company with a lot of computer access, but what about the guys who work out in the field and aren't at the computer all day? Do they have them at home? Would they do the assessment at home? So that's another thing where it's really important to have a coalition together, because whereas the national network compares what works in Rhode Island and Utah, also within those networks, they know what works with the companies that they use. So it's, it's really interesting and exciting how um, you can find out about different products and new products, you tend sometimes to become a little isolationist. You're so busy doing your job that you forget there are other people out there doing the same job. And we have recently been um, able to use a nice HRA. Uh, you remember me talking about benchmarking not only with yourself, but with other people in your industry and in your state. But there's one that was developed through the National Network, had some input on it. And Nebraska.gov developed it. And it's called the LiveWell Survey. It's $5 a head to do this survey. It's an online survey. But it will give an immediate health assessment to your person. It'll also help your company benchmark against like industries in the same state. No other. Um, you know, HRA out there does this kind of thing. It compares data. There are algorithms that run with the CDC's database for their uh, community health surveys that they do. And it is amazing that, you know, for $5 you can offer this when a lot of health assessments are costing $20, $25, $50 a piece. So that is an amazing thing, and we would never have known about it if we hadn't been involved with the national network. Um, and there are other tools out there like that. That is a fantastic survey. It's the only one of its kind out there. But on the other hand, it, it can't, you know, it doesn't work for everybody, and we understand that. Um, plan the initiative. Focus on results, not activities. Uh, things should be fun. Things should be uh, uh, interesting, and people should want to be involved with what you and your council are doing. But you really need to focus on the mission and let that drive what you do. Uh, a chief mistake of a lot of new nonprofits or a lot of new councils is to try to chase grant funding and you end up changing your mission. Well, we'll just do this so we can have this grant funding and the next thing you know, you're not working on corporate wellness anymore. So I think you need to stay true to what you determine your mission is. Um, some of the councils work on things besides corporate wellness and that's fine, but the one thing we all have in common is the focus on the employee, the employee and the employer, and protecting the workforce of the country. Um, you need to address issues that you find in your assessments and consider goals. You need to, as a council, uh, do assessments with your membership. Find out what they want, what they need. So you know, take the temperature, take the pulse of that group. Um, I always say, this is another one of my favorite sport quotes, I not only knocked them out, but I chose what round. That's what a written wellness plan will do. It's time for your state, your region to get organized 
and to uh, start addressing the community needs, not just my company, not just my little area of the world, but uh, this community where we live. If we want it to be conducive for business, if we want employers to be able to move in and not have to worry about whether or not they can afford to insure our people or train our people, then we need to have uh, a healthy workforce and an able workforce, a productive group of citizens that can be employed. This is a little example of what a written wellness plan looks like. And um, this is something that uh, you just basically fill in the blank. We used to have people write out paragraphs of what their plans were going to be. And someone showed us this little matrix, and we just thought, wow, we've been taking a long way around the barn for a long time. If you have all this stuff answered, you've basically got a written wellness plan. You've got the date, you've got the objective, you've got a program, you've got the process that you're going to do it, the responsible party, and then over here you've got how you're going to measure it and, and evaluate it. Some people even add what the incentive is going to be, you know, uh, how much it's going to cost or budget. <clears throat> when you enact the interventions that you're going to put into place as a council, you need to weigh the wants of the groups that you're working with versus their needs, respect the different companies, the sizes of the groups that you're working with, and the resources and experience that they have. Some companies have been doing wellness for years and can be real champions within a council. And other companies will catch up quickly. And then some companies, a lot of your small businesses, don't have the full-time person to do a wellness program. And you need to understand that they may need the most help for the fewest people when you first start out. Uh, some of the common program areas that that councils will get involved in are listed here above. I'm going to tell you the one that most people need to work on is the stress management issue. Contributes to all chronic disease, is not necessarily inherited, and is something that everybody's got to monitor. So the self-care, the stress management are two big, huge issues that uh, councils need to work on. We have a, a big grant for tobacco work at the council in West Virginia. We have had grants for community wellness, all of them include a mental health issue. And not just people stop smoking, people stop, you know, lose weight, people do this. But if they stop smoking, make sure they don't pick up 20 pounds. If they lose weight, make sure they didn't do it because they started gambling. You know, everyone acts out in certain ways, but what is it that causes them to do it? You need to get to the root of the issues. And I think that programming needs to, to respect that for all companies. Some uncommon things we've had a lot of luck with in a lot of the councils lately are farmers market, mobile farmers market that go from company to company, um, low-cost healthy choices in local restaurants and in cafeterias. It, you know, if I can get three hot dogs for a dollar versus the seven-dollar chicken sandwich, grilled chicken sandwich, you know, the seven dollars is going to eat me up eventually. So you need to, to have people look at that kind of thing. Healthy potluck, community lunches, audit the vending machines in your public areas. Work on blended families. This is something that a lot of the councils have started programming on too, is blended families and the problem at home is a problem at work, and internet security. That's a large issue for companies right now. There are hackers. There's all kinds of things going on out there in that cyber world, Facebook, and all these things that people do and don't have access to at work. But they're, they're, uh, they make our companies really vulnerable. And we need to look very closely at internet security and help our member companies protect themselves. Um, make sure that your members and their employees get the message wherever they are in that continuum of change. They need to be aware of wellness issues and health issues. They need to be educated on things that are viable for their population. But they all need to move towards behavior change. Um, not just another walking program, but the one that works for the people that, you know, at their community. Review everything that you do for results. Uh, we say four to five questions with easy answers. Focus on the content and the process. Leave it open-ended if they want it. Give them room to write, but don't take it personally, and don't try to stop people from, from making suggestions. These are a lot of the questions that we ask, uh, and we encourage companies to ask. We ask this of our companies when we do trainings. We encourage our companies to ask this of their people when they do trainings and, and health, wellness interventions. Um, if the program met its objective, the instructor was knowledgeable, 
I'll get a benefit from this. Sometimes I take the environment question out because I don't control the temperature in a room, but hand out the materials for beneficials and then leave the back of that page for them to write whatever they want to write. But give them the one to five to circle and go with it from there. Um, revisit statistics from the assessments at a predetermined interval every two or three years. Don't be afraid to change the focus. Uh, the Canal Coalition for Community Health Improvement is one group that I said like does a, a three-year uh, survey. They base their work for the next three years off of those results. It's a very intensive process. They only do it every three years, but it has really helped them to make some huge leaps uh, with, with health statistics. I think the seatbelt usage went from the high 70s to the low 90s in a matter of six years when this was showing up on their um, intervention. That's a huge, huge uh, accomplishment for them. In conclusion, the chronic disease costs our community, it costs our businesses. There are five components to making a local initiative work. Uh, there are four strategies that we discussed earlier for working, for engaging leaders of the community and leaders of businesses. We had showed you some tools for assessing the health and readiness of community and the key sources for evaluating outcomes. Don't ever be afraid to evaluate. Um, adversity doesn't build character, it reveals that it's never easy to start a, you know, a new uh, process. A lot of times you feel like it, you know, somebody's out there doing this, we all need to just coordinate our efforts. That's what the Wellness Council is for, to take all those people out there doing different pieces of the program and put it together, you know, to build an engine, so to speak, to run the whole area. <clears throat> if you want to contact us, this is the contact information. The headquarters for National Network is located at the uh, Wellness Council of West Virginia. And that is the email where you can reach me, Sharon Covert, and the phone number. And then the uh, website also. Actually, we're revitalizing the website today. And it will come up looking different, hopefully, here by the end of business. But if you have any questions or anything like that, Michael, they're welcome to ask. Or if you want to pass them on to me, I sure did enjoy doing the webinar, and I hope that uh, we can work with some, some local communities. Great, Sharon. So yeah, if you have questions, uh, you can type them in, or if you're a very brave person and you want to raise your hand, um, mm -hmm. actually, you don't have to be brave, but I don't know why people don't like to do that. <laughs> you know, unlike, dare I say, you and I, uh, I don't think people <laughs> like to talk as much as you and I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm for 45 minutes strong, you know, so. Yeah. Well, you know, I thought it was, uh, so, so please type your questions in if you have them. Um, I, th I was, um, I really didn't realize the, the number of different things that are out there. You know, I thought, like the, uh, like the regional um, uh, coalitions, what is it, work, workplace, oh, geez. Oh, the Business Coalition on Health? Yes, I couldn't spit that out. Thank you. I, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I didn't realize there were regional um, affiliates of that. I just knew of the one, you know, in D.C. Um, yeah, we're members of the, they call themselves the Mid-Atlantic, you know, Business Coalition on Health, and they're out of Baltimore, and they cover the Baltimore, D.C. area. I think there's one just for D.C., if I'm not mistaken. This one is more Northern Virginia, uh, Maryland. And then mm. we're members of the one that is the Virginia Business Coalition on Health, which is out of Richmond. And they also do some work out in Norfolk in that area. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we get a lot of mailings and stuff from and invitations to attend luncheons once a month. But um, the big thing is they, they do a lot of, uh, you know, they're, they're more involved in the politics of a lot of things, uh, mm. you know, strength in numbers, whereas the national network is more involved with the actual resources for a council to start and be viable immediately. You know, you can do these trainings, you can do this, this is what sells and works here, and this is what sells and works here. And, um, you know, to, to have people, you know, provide what is needed immediately so that the council can be around. We've been around since the mid-80s huh. here in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of the councils have been around that long. It's kind of wild to, to think about it that way, but, you know, for over 30 years, people have been, you know, doing this sort of thing. Hmm. 
Interesting. Well, here's a, I guess, a similar question. Um, are the um, the Chamber of Commerce, are most councils uh, connected with the Chamber of Commerce? Do the, do the, the local chambers, are they, more, are they most commonly involved or not so much? Or We see it a little of both. I know um, in Maine, in Indiana, in Kentucky, they're very closely tied, if not housed, in the Chamber of Commerce, the state. Chamber of Commerce. Other groups, like I say, are not involved with the state chamber as far as from a, you know, being financially or even physically tied in the same area. We work with local chambers in my state, but and we're members of several local chambers as well as the state chamber, but we don't uh, collaborate as far as co-programming. I see. So really there's there's kind of no, there's no one way by any stretch of the imagination to do this. There's really not. There's not. I know in Indiana and Kentucky it works very well for the chamber to have started this and to perpetuate it. The, the council in West Virginia actually began as a division of state government, believe it or not, and then achieved separate nonprofit private status. So, you know, it really is a matter of, of growing where you're planted and, and figuring out what worked in your region. It, it comes to be in different ways. Hmm. Interesting. So even some, some councils were created through their state departments of health. I wouldn't have thought of that, right. but I guess it makes perfect sense. Yeah, and that's exactly where we came from. We hmm. were part of the DHHR, the Division of Health and Human Resources in West Virginia, under the Division of uh, Rehab Services. Hmm. So uh, another question, are, are all the councils nonprofits or, or are they working towards it? Is that also a requirement or how does uh, that work? All the ones we work with are nonprofit. We don't, we don't uh, work with consulting groups. We are approached sometimes by consultants, um, way different way of doing things. Hmm. We are well, like I said, the Live Well survey is $5 a head to, to give that survey. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm a consultant, I'm probably charging $25 a head and then a fee to, to, you know, initiate reporting and then an interpretation coaching fee and all this stuff. Um, we want this clinical expertise, these top shelf programs, but I'm not trying to make, you know, I'm not trying to get my retirement home in Boca Raton paid for <laughs> by it. <laughs> It's one of, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing. We're interested in the data. We're driving the high quality, top shelf data. And that's the kind of thing that we want. So, um, yes, we work with nonprofits and we're helping others, you know, some of them to obtain nonprofit status. Mm -hmm. Now, on, on the, uh, another question, on the, on the National Network's website, is there a listing of all the councils that currently exist? Is there any way of finding out Who's doing what? It's on the website. Like I said, the website's under construction today. Um, ah. It was kind of, kind of unfortunate timing, but it'll it'll be back up. But yeah, there is a listing. I named um, some of them when we started off. Forgive me, I've got a little cheat sheet in front of me. Um, California, Arizona, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, Nebraska, Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, West Virginia. Formative okay. initiatives and coalitions who are presently working with us are in Washington State, Utah, Kansas, Oklahoma, Kentucky, and North Carolina. We also have partners with the Centers for Disease Control, Health Enhancement Research Organization, National Wellness Institute, and of course your group, Michael. Oh, excellent. Among, among others. We yeah, work sure. with the American Institute for Preventive Medicine, with their conference, and um, you know, different things. We, we, we have on and off partnerships to, for events, but those are our main collaborators. When we sat down as councils and the, the founding councils for this network, well, West Virginia, Lincoln, Nebraska, Indiana, and um, Arizona and Rhode Island, we sat down and said, who needs to help us guide this from an outside of the council world perspective? And, you know, we had a contact at the CDC. They have a big section on employer health and employer, you know, prevention. And so, you know, we really 
picked and chose our partners carefully, someone that wouldn't come in and say, well, you have to drive this program or we won't help you mm -hmm. is not who we're interested in. We want to have someone says, have you heard of this program? Do you know about it? You might want to tell people about it, you know, but, but not someone who's trying to do a hard sell through us. That's, mm -hmm. that's not what we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's see. And if you if you if you get on the, the website and it's down right now, send me an email and I can send you information. That info at wcwv.org comes straight to me. Ah, okay, that's good. Um, now, I guess as as things are happening, um, is are there the question is are there ways to sort of connect with the with people as they're as they're forming these and you know maybe potentially contribute to one that would be local to them. Uh, and my first thought was, I believe you have a LinkedIn group. Um, yes, yes. Uh, I, I am in on LinkedIn, but we don't do a lot of the council communications through that. We, we do have that affiliation on LinkedIn. But if you want to uh, be on the listserv, the distribution list for the national network for your region, you just need to contact me, and we'll get you on. Ah, okay, that's good. Uh, let's see, anything else, you guys? Other good questions? Those are good questions. <laughs> those are, those well, are excellent questions. Well, yeah, it's, it seems like uh, there's there's a lot of interest out there, and it's uh, awesome to know that so much is going on, and you know, so many well, places we around the country. Started, yeah, when we first started in 2008, we actually did searches of nonprofits and the public 990s and we called every state we could get information on where there was a council anything that called themselves a council or a coalition um, you know and uh, anybody who'd ever you know been formally formed we we contacted to see if they were what we were if they were interested in what we did and we really tried to send that outreach out there and then you find when you go to conferences, when you go to trainings, I speak at a lot of conferences, national and regional, and uh, you know people come up to you and say, "Hey, you know, we've got a group in in Alabama, or we've got a group here." And I actually had a, I was speaking in Las Vegas last year, and I had two people in the room. One was from Florida, and one was from Hawaii, and they said, "We use your website all the time." Talking about the West Virginia website, <laughs> wcwv.org, which I thought was hilarious. She said, "Yeah, oh yeah, we steal your stuff all the time. You really should password protect that." <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, no, it's supposed to be you. That's, I just never imagined it was being used in Hawaii. But hey, if you ever need someone to come consult on that, I'm I'm happy to, you know, fulfill a need there. Yeah, well, don't forget me. Yeah, yeah. I'll, right. I'll carry your darn bags. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. Always ready to take one for the team. Yeah, well, you know, what can you do? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think uh, I think we're out of questions, and that's pretty good because we're basically out of time, out of time. as well. So. Thanks so much, Sharon. Uh, it was thank you all. Thank great. You all you're much. you're uh, you're an awesome wealth of knowledge. Um, so uh, thanks so much for being here, and have a great weekend. You too. Thank you to everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye.